this baptismal service. That's the first man, by God's description, that walked this wall. Are you with me? That man, the devil could not deceive. That man, the devil could not conquer. Are you here? Now, so if those kind of men function, that's God's idea, that's God's definition of a man. Jesus, that came to John the Baptist's baptismal service. And that was why heaven bore witness that this one, this is my beloved son, this is the definition of man that I had in mind all this time. Because prior to this time, there has never been any man that is suitable and suitably fits my description of men. What we have been is that we have been men after the mankind. But by design, we were intended by God to be what? Men after the God kind. That means we have the capacity to manifest the divine attributes of God through our human virtues. That is a possibility for us because we are created in the image of God. The way your spirit was designed, for instance, your spirit was designed as a vessel that has a capacity to contain God. All right. Let's go. If you are still with me, say amen. Now, so we are going to build some truth gradually. Gradually. Because... Our modern day church system mostly has been designed to accommodate man of man. And we are trying to improve man of man. Like if man of man has a car, he'll, life will be better. If man of man has a breakthrough, you'll be able to survive the challenges of life. And he will break even. <laughs> we are not seeing the vision of God. Now, Jesus operated the way he operated naturally. That was his nature. Because he was designed to be like that. Are you with me? And so we are trying to move beyond the scope of the aberration. And then to fit into the context of God's design and description of us. And there are provisions that have been made available to enhance us function of this, on this plane and on this frame of reference. And let's go to the book of Second Peter. We have a long journey. We are just start taking off tonight. I, as we progress, you will see that some of the things we call big spiritual things are actually normal things. They are not big spiritual things. That you could pick something from the spirit realm. That's who you are. That's how you should function. Just in case you are not functioning that way, you are, you are operating with the technology of man of man. That being has been mastered by the devil. That being will always be frustrated by the kingdom of darkness. That being has been measured out in the balances of darkness and it has been, it has been judged to be incapable of contending with the power of the devil. Are you with me? Now, so the question is this. How do you intend to function? Because there are two modes of oppression. In that, by the time... Okay, let's go. The scriptural reading will help us and give us perspective so that we can manage the time we have. Second Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So, who is he writing to here? Simon Peter, this is an apostle. Someone that has served God, servant of Jesus Christ, he has worked with Jesus Christ for quite some time now, and now he's writing to people that have a like precious faith. Are you with me? This is directed to believers, people that have found Jesus through faith. There's a reason why he makes that emphasis in his salutation. Because there are two possible planes of oppression. You can operate from the natural plane and you can operate from your position in faith. Alright? If you decide to operate from your natural plane, it means that you are subscribing to the philosophy of man in man. You are operating from your soul. 
from the perspective of the things that you have seen and known. And on that perspective, you are vulnerable to the devil because he knows you on that perspective and he has mastered you. In fact, you are his subject on the account of the fall. So he's writing to people that have light, precious faith. Trying to bring them into the full economy and the full implication of the faith that they have. So that they can live within the scope of the provisions of that faith to their full potential. Hallelujah. Now, if we had time and we had digressed, for instance, to really find out what exactly is blessing in Scripture. Blessing. That word blessing. Our perspective of it, if we are operating from the natural position, is different from the perspective of that word, if we are operating from our position in faith. Most of what we say about the word blessing is not consistent with our position in faith. Now, Jesus used that word many times, but the way he used it was quite different from the way we are using it now. Now, from the standpoint of our reality, we are going to check some things and you see that it sustains a different value from what we have said it is. Okay, so he's writing to guys that have a like precious faith. It's likened to believers, people that have come to Jesus, have responded to the call. Okay. What's his message to them? He said, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. Now, Peter is saying something. Please, I'd like us to pay keen attention to what he's saying. And the only possibility was grace and peace are spiritual resources. A man that is operating in the framework, his framework as man of man, from his natural position, might never see any need for grace. And he may not even see a need for peace too. He said the resources that have been made available to ensure your success in the faith that you have come into will be multiplied, not added, but multiplied geometrically in your life. Because there is no scarcity of resources in the economy of the spirit. And so he says, grace and peace will be multiplied unto you through one means and one means only. Through what? The knowledge of God. And I want to shake you a little. Because the word knowledge there it's not the knowledge that you can acquire in the classroom. It's not a knowledge that you can learn. And it's not a knowledge that can be taught. It's a knowledge that is handed out. It's a knowledge that is revealed. And it says that the only possibility that we have or the only access that is possible to us to grace and to peace which are bountiful spiritual resources that we need to take advantage of in advancing in the faith that we have received unto conformity to the perspective of the gospel of God is only accessible through the knowledge of God. Now, you see, you will notice that this man is no longer speaking to man of man. Not speaking to you that is called Osaki. That's not it's not it's addressing a you that is in dire need of grace and peace. And that you that is addressing needs a geometric and a bountiful release of grace for you to operate within that scope optimally. And it happens to be that that grace. Not fuel. Grace is like spiritual fuel. It's like, it's like the energy that is made available to us to live the spiritual life. Just like you need petrol to run your car. Okay? You need grace to do every spiritual thing. And grace is not in such, such supply in the spirit realm. Grace is abundant. But it's not just accessible by everybody and anybody. 
Grace is only accessible through the knowledge of God, the epignosis of God, the revealed knowledge that comes from God. Is that one clear? I will explain further. Because as we journey into being partakers of the divine nature, we are going to see the place of that revealed knowledge and how the revealed knowledge comes. And what we need to do to stay within the scope of that revealed knowledge, if it's going to be the only means that we have available to us to access grace, which is the fuel that keeps us going in spirit life. Hallelujah. So, he said, grace and peace be what? And so what happens to a man that doesn't have access to a multiplied grace and peace. What happens to a man? The insufficiencies of his natural life replace the dynamism of his spiritual life. But one thing is sure. If we are operating on the natural plane, we are going to be insufficient because the Bible says, that we, by default, by creation, our human life was fashioned with, with insufficiencies and inadequacies. So that we, that alone will make us desire a higher life. As far as lion is concerned, because he was, his lion created in the image of lion, he doesn't feel insufficient as a lion. He's fulfilled. But, the reason why you will not feel fulfilled being a natural man, natural woman, is because you were not created that way. That's not your design mode. So people have learned how to live without the abundance of grace. So they have allowed the natural configuration of things to take the place of the dynamism of the spirit and they have submitted to that mode. And they call it their faith. That's why the truth of the word of God needs to come to make us break from the cocoons of slavery and to latch on to the provisions that are available to us in the spirit realm. Then and then alone can we mount up with wings like eagles and we run and not be weary. We go beyond the insufficiencies of the human life because we have access to the resources that have been made available to us in the spirit in keeping with the design model for man that was created to be in the image of God. Now, he says, verse 3 is very technical. According as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, that divine power, I did a very good study of that. I, I think in order for us to understand it very well, let us substitute divine power for authority. According as his authority, by an act of his authority, he has what? Given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. The word life there is not natural life. Because the people he's speaking to are not natural people, are people that receive like precious faith. The word there for life is Zoe. He said that by an act of God's authority, he has given us everything that pertains to the operation of the divine life and the manifestation of the divine life through human vessels. Because godliness is a scenario, it's a reality that finds expression when human beings take advantage of the investment of divinity and manifest the attributes of divinity through human virtues. He said that provision has been made and by an act of God's authority he has given us all the spare parts that are intended to drive the divine life that is in us so that we operate in godliness. We operate the way God intends us to operate. We operate with the resources and with the energy of God in this life. So all of the spare parts, all of the, the additives, all of the plug-ins, that are required in order for us to be able to adapt 
to the God life and to function from the plane of the God life by an act of his authority, he has made it available to him. Notice he's talking to who? People that are recipients of what? A like precious faith. Now, so the things he's talking about here are not supposed to be strange things to the people that he was addressing. Are you still with me? Hey. This are you here. I need your attention. Okay. Need your attention. I'm trying to teach today so that I can bring us where we can interact together. Many times we we'll come for some meetings and it's powerful and the Holy Ghost comes down and people are blessed, but we cannot maintain what has come upon us because what came to us is multiplied grace and peace. And if we don't have the technique of accessing it every other day, those resources that came upon us by an act of the sovereignty of God, the authority of God, will not add any value to our life. Did you get that? So he says, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto what? Unto life and what? Unto godliness. How are these things that are made available to us by the authority of God accessible? Accessible through what? The knowledge of him that has called us unto glory and virtue. And that was why he gave us a salutation. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. He gave us that salutation because the knowledge of God, the epignosis is key to functioning in the hallowed place that he has conferred upon us and the attendant resources he has bestowed upon us to function effectively in that hallowed place. So without the knowledge of him that has called us unto glory and virtue, we will find it difficult to access the multiplied grace that is available in the spirit realm. You are still with me, say amen. Now, I want this to be very practicable and very easy for us to assimilate. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. And let me give you an example so that we can drive our point home. I, was, I took a three-day fast some time ago and uh, I slot in Benny Hinn's tape watching him was manifesting power. And I was talking to God. I said, God, is this kind of thing only for Benihin? And then while I was saying that, Benihin began to answer me from the tape. And he said, this is not only for me. So that means he was talking to people with like precious faith. That this thing I'm manifesting is not an extraordinary thing. It's a normal thing that should happen to people that are possessors of this faith. Oh. Not only for me, it's for everybody. You can access this realm. You can, this is how we are. We were created in this super image. And if you explore the deposits and the resources of this image, it should be a natural occurrence. So I'm not a superstar. I'm just a proof that there's a superstar. And his name is Jesus. Now, so Benny Hinn now said, All right, if you want the power, stretch your hand. So I now stretch my hand towards the screen. And he began to pray that the power of God should come upon us and begin to function in us. While he was praying that prayer, I felt something like a weight here. All right? And that weight was so intense. And it was there for like 30 minutes after I finished praying. And I noticed something that anytime I go for a prayer meeting and we're high in spirit, I feel that weight. Now, I kept feeling that weight and kept enjoying that weight. I love that weight when it comes. Wow! It's here again. But you see, it took five years for me to understand that that weight was a healing anointing. Until God revealed to me through the knowledge of Christ that, hey, that thing you enjoy is my power to heal. I could not access it. I could not administer it. I could not release it because I did not know I was feeling it. I was experiencing it, but it was not profitable either to me or to anybody because I have not accessed the knowledge of that which was moving on my life. Now, Peter is saying that there is multiplied grace upon us. 
is accessible. The resources of the Spirit are not in short supply. But in order for it to be profitable to us, we must have the knowledge that is handed out. The knowledge that is revealed. The knowledge that cannot be taught. The knowledge that you cannot learn. That knowledge must be given to you. Are you with me? So he came through five years later and told me that that was the healing anointing. And it was in that knowledge, the time that that knowledge came, that I knew what I was handling. And when I prayed for people in faith under the influence of that weight, they got healed. And that means I was enjoying something that was supposed to be operational and functional and a blessing to my family, a blessing to people around me, but it could not bless them. Neither could it bless me because I was devoid of what I was carrying and I was devoid of high, high function. And so the golden rule to access the deposits that we have access to in Christ and to administer it and release it as blessings upon people's lives and to walk in the realms of God is dependent on revealed knowledge of Christ. Hallelujah. The revealed knowledge of Christ. The revealed knowledge of Christ. Now, we are going to go further. And we'll try to find out how exactly is this knowledge? Amen. Verse 4. Whereby, I hope you know whereby means because of what was said before. Because of the need for us to function in life and godliness. Whereby are given unto us exceeding and, and precious promises. Why? And by this ye might be partakers of the divine nature. So the great and the precious promises given to us in scripture are like baits. Alright? They are like what? Baits that are supposed to draw us to partake of the divine nature, which is our destiny. For instance, God speaks to you and said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's a promise. A promise carries the will of the sovereign. The promise was invoked from the realm of the divine life and is a wonder to people that operate, operate from the realm of human logic. Now, when the promise comes from God, it is a bait that is expected to draw us in search of God until we become partakers of the divine nature. Why does God need to use a bait to draw us into what he has kept for us? Because we are so used to operating naturally that we do not desire what God is offering. Hallelujah. The major struggle that God has with every one of us is for us to leave the scope and the confidence that we have gained in our natural ability in search of God's sufficiency. Because it's easier for us to hold on to the things that we have seen and known. Hallelujah. Those days in the university, I had a strange intellectual power. You know, I could cram much more than anybody I've seen on earth. I could lift 235 pages of handout and know the pages and the structure. So when you ask me a question, I can tell you that it's in page 215. And I can recite the handout. And it, it doesn't take me too long to cram the handout. Secondly, if I pick your notebook and I see a structure in your notebook, and I look at it for a few minutes, I can snap it. It's scanned in my brain. I can go into the exam hall and produce it. Then I'll forget it. 
That one doesn't last for long. So if I scan it, that's the first question I will answer. I will drop it. So I don't read. I preach. I preach everywhere. A few days to the exam, I come. I leave the whole note. Now, in doing that, I now gain so much confidence in my intellectual ability. And that was where my confidence was. Not in God, but what? Now that's why God fights with us. So what God did, he knew that my life had been designed by reason of those exploits I, 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 I made. My life was unconsciously designed to rest on the confidence I had in my intellectual ability. And God wanted to use me. So what he did was that he allowed me cram one day. And when I got into the hall... He blew on me. Is it, is it that he allowed the devil to touch my head or something? I don't know. But the thing I crammed. Why he did that was because he desperately wants me to participate in the divine resources that he has made available. But I'm content with my own natural configuration. Now, human beings will rather trust the things that they have seen and known. They don't like something that they have not yet, their senses have not seen. But God wants to sharpen your spiritual senses so that you trust it more than your natural senses. But, the way you are structured, you have survived on your skills. You have survived on your gift. You have survived in your ability to make money and all of that. And if God wants to take you higher, it's not as if he wants to hurt you. But the only way he can achieve it is to shut down some of those your confidences so that you can have an opportunity to look outside of the box and to look into that which is offering you. So he gives unto us great and precious promises. You know, when he wanted you to come into ministry, he started speaking to you about ministry and telling you the things he will do. And then I said, no, no, no. No, this business. Then he will touch that business. And suddenly... The confidence you have developed for yourself begins to go down. And all that is left is the promise that he has given you. And that promise becomes the gangway that leads you into the pool of the resources that God has made available in order for you to fulfill your divine destiny as orchestrated by him. So there are some setbacks that we experience that is not actually God ordained. But God did not have any choice anymore because of the fact that we have confidence in our ability. It's not as if God will not bless those our abilities eventually when we have found the things that he wants us to find. Because when I now submitted to what he was calling me into and I accepted it, the brain came back. The brain came back. In fact, the brain came back so much that I wanted to cram the whole New Testament. So intense like that. And he now told me again, that see, even if I leave the whole New Testament, it doesn't mean that I know him through the pages. So I now stopped doing, even in the gospel too, I wanted to use the brain. But as God released so many promises that were enticing, and then he now touched the environment and touched my ability, my ability could no longer produce. I had only one access point and I began to move. I was not sure, but And as I was moving into that, you know that situation, all right, of the other things you have confidence in collapsing. And then you now resolving to move through that tightrope. That's what God calls blessed. And I can show you from Genesis to Revelation. That's not what men call blessed. You look down, you look out, but you have found that access route and you are loyal through promises. To walk the path of spiritual progress. That resolve from God's perspective is what he calls. So if he sends an angel to you that time, you say, oh, bless and highly favored. But when you look around, you may not see something in the circumstance that suggests that that salutation is for you. And you begin to wonder. And you notice that when... Are you with me? Now, so there's a bait... That he puts in place to draw you. And those baits are great and what? Precious promises. 
He invades your mind with all kinds of dreams. And you wake up and you look around and say, Hey! No, the angel missed his way. This is not, no, I'm... Then he gets to a point where he knows he will trust what you know. So he touches those things. And pegs them. And his government goes to work. Until he can harvest you. To walk the path of them like precious faith. That's the path of your destiny. Into the resources that he has made available. It is from that point that you now begin to discover the powers that are available. Now, the reason for this conference is to bring us to that point And then show us the path that we are going to walk. And if for everybody that is born again is entitled to that reality. But it happens to be that for about 20 years, 25 years, about 30 years now in the body of Christ, most of the things we emphasize in church are things that are management rations for the natural man. How to manage him, psych him, excite him, give him a false sense of the blessing coming tomorrow, next week contract, there will be a phone call you know, his flesh is excited man is so excited when there is hope it's Hope, so we give him hope and then he goes outside, he meets the devil he fails in warfare he crawls again into church on Wednesday the prayers will revive him maybe somebody from the choir will sing something that will lift his spirit he's always down, he's always down because his expectations are dashed for the Bible says hope deferred Make it the heart sick. So his heart is always sick because the things he's trying to latch onto, they are not coming to him. His expectations are not fulfilled. Meanwhile, that's why testimonies are a major part of our services. Somebody that made it, somebody that broke through, comes to testify that okay, something is still happening. So you now say, all right, happened for matter. Okay, happened. And that's fake. Now Jesus is not a money doubler. He doesn't give men false hope. There is a place of power that he wants you to function in. He designed you to function that way. And if you can give him half a chance, he will manifest powers through you that are stronger than time. And so a time has come. People are tired of church now. They are tired of the routine. Because for 15 years, 14 years, they've been doing the same thing. The prophecies didn't come to pass. All, all fake things going on. One day they did four feet washing service. We came for the service. For feet washing. They said this feet washing is against death. No more death. No more death. And we say, eh, eh, God, I will die. God. And after service, we're just living like that. Okada jammed some people there. It was accident. About four people just died. After, with wash feet. The water has not yet dried. And so when you recycle that for 14 years, people's soul become faint. And then they begin to seek for the real God, begin to seek how to do business with him and how to enter into his economy. And there is a hunger that is upon Africa right now. It's an intense hunger. And it's not just hunger, there's also oppression. Because, because we have not known the real God, the devil has made himself relevant. And many ministries have picked up a case against the devil as the major contract of the Christian. Another deviation entirely. And the average believer doesn't have any possibility of entering into the knowledge of his God. He's, he's at the mercy of life. And so Peter begins to speak to us that the secret into these realities is that we must come to that point where we have access to what? The revealed knowledge of Christ. I want to show us two scriptures and how that knowledge operates, how we can access it on a daily basis. As long as you have the Holy Ghost in you, you are a recipient for that dimension. I'll teach you how to walk into that knowledge, how to take advantage of um, the, the knowledge, and how to build into that knowledge to intercept and to interact with the realm of your reality, which is in Zion. If you are still here, say Amen. Now, in the morning session tomorrow, we are going to take time and if we have writing material i'm going to do a lot of writing and show out a lot of stuff that will open our understanding and i trust that god will help us in the name of jesus christ hallelujah
Now, so turn with me quickly. I'm trying to round up right now to the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So there's a new thing that is happening across the continent of Africa. The hunger that is being released through the people of God is attracting the consent of heaven. And God is falling upon some people and opening their understanding and bringing to them the knowledge of Christ so that equipping and building of the house of God can go into another level. It is only in that day that the least among us can be as strong as David. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, um, Paul said in verse 16, uh, verse 15, he says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and love unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of of him. Now, so uh, there, there is something that controls entrance into the knowledge of God. Are you with me? Are you not with me? There's something that controls knowledge, entrance into the knowledge of God. It's called the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, okay. Maybe when we read on, you understand the scope of things. Now, so you need the spirit of wisdom and revelation to access the knowledge of him. Okay? And when the spirit of wisdom and revelation is at work in your life, the result is that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. I'm going to explain to us those are spiritual terms uh, describing spiritual realities. When the spirit of wisdom and revelation that reveals the knowledge of him is at work on your life, what does it do? It opens up the eyes of your understanding. And, it, and it's only when the eyes of your understanding are enlightened that ye know these spiritual issues. One, the hope of his calling. You cannot access the hope of his calling. Why he's calling you. Why he called you. Why he summoned you into salvation. Because the why he summoned you, the answer to that, is actually because he has an eternal purpose that he's working out. And there is no way you can understand God's eternal purpose except the eyes of your understanding are enlightened. It means that there's a scope of knowledge that is beyond that which is in the classroom that God needs to equip our hearts with in order for us to understand the scope of things that God is doing and the resources he has made available. Now, you can never understand the hope of his calling except the eyes of your understanding are enlightened. You can never understand the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints except the eyes of your understanding are enlightened. You can never understand what the exceeding greatness of his power toward us is who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. There is no way you can understand those riches and those resources. There is no way you can understand the workings of the power of God that was manifest in Christ Jesus when he was raised from the dead. And that is the scripture that captures the four Greek words for power, as I always say. And, it, you know, Paul exhausted language. In trying to explain to us the power that was at work in Jesus when he was raised from the dead. Those are realities that we cannot have access to until we are operating under the auspices of the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God that leads to the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. Now, notice something. As we go into the practicalities and the life application mode of the truth that we are bringing. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Notice that Paul, Peter was praying and he said, 
Paul was praying, sorry. He said, when I heard of your faith, I did not cease to pray. That God the Father will grant unto you 